Hello everyone, welcome to lab number eight. The topic for today is information and movement, and we are gonna feature and talk about Fitt's law. So today's lab is lab number eight, movement, and information. Featuring Dr. Paul Fitt's famous law, Paul Fitt's law. The idea of this lab is to basically help you understand the trade-off between speed and accuracy from the perspective of very basic mathematics. So we are going to talk about trade-off between speed and accuracy. As you can understand, if you want to increase your speed as you do a certain thing, if you want to increase your speed, your accuracy will decrease. So this idea is highlighted by the fact, uh, well, this idea is basically shown through a very basic standard mathematical tool based on straight line equation. However, the actual mathematical equation for this Fitts law goes like this. Movement time, movement time, which is called mt in seconds, careful with the unit, is equal to a plus b and a weird number. This number is log base of 2, 1 plus distance and width of the target. Now what is meant by distance and width? In this ex experiment today or this lab, we are going to have a tapping game. We're gonna play a tapping game. So we have two coins placed right next to each other. They are set at a distance so if this is the center of coin one, is this if this is coin two, the distance between them is distance. This information goes right here. And the width of the target, which is the coin over here, is in diameters, which goes over here. So, and, yeah, so, and all this information over here, this information, log two, one plus distance divided by the width, gives you a measure of how difficult the task is. Now, let me take this part over to the right to the left, so that specific thing is called index of difficulty. So it's called DI, difficulty index or index of difficulty. This is an or sign. And it says, so this is log of two, one plus distance divided by width of the target. So it gives you a measure about how difficult 
this tapping process is. So this is the center. This is the distance between the two centers of the coins. So this is coins, two coins. And this is the diameter, which is the width of the target. Now, the game is to tap. So it's like this. You start from here, somebody starts a timer for 30 seconds. And what you do actually is you start tapping from one place to another. So you start here. Somebody starts the timer saying start. And we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And the number of taps that you make within this 30 seconds, you save it in one table. So the number of taps in 30 seconds. It goes into a table. And where do you fit this information or where do you place this information depends on the condition. Here the condition is distance and the width criteria. So you can see we have four different cri criteria. So if you plug those individual criteria here, you get an individual index of difficulty. Since we have four different criteria, set of criteria or conditions, we will have four different index of difficulty. And now, the thing that you need to understand is if the distance between these two coins are increased, keeping the width constant. In that case, if you compute this data, you will see that the index of difficulty increases. So the further apart the two objects are, the more difficult is the task. Now the same thing goes the other way around. If you keep this width constant, and if you decrease the distance between the two, so if the coins are close, in that case it's easier for you to tap and to make less error. So if this goes down, mathematically you will see this index of difficulty would go down as well. Now, let's consider some other different criteria. Now, let us keep the distance fixed, as opposed to the target width to be fixed. Let's keep this distance fixed. And yeah, so one second. So, if we keep this distance to be constant now and change the width, if we increase the width over here, we will see mathematically that the index of difficulty would go down. What does it mean? It means if this circle grows bigger as depicted by the increase of width and so does this circle because they are the same size it's easier for you to tap which is highlighted by the fact the index of difficulty goes down the other way around would be if the width of the target is small, so this grows smaller like this, it's hard for you to make correct movements and you have to adjust to the trade-off 
And you can find mathematically that the difficulty index increases. Now you can also consider these two combinations when you have your own free time. So that is what is stated over here. The state's law, so, okay, let's, before I get into that. So I hope you have understood till this part. Let me raise this. This was index of difficulty. take this portion as well because I think you have the mental picture of the whole idea here. So if we have a look into this equation now and reduce this equation is this becomes movement time is equal to A plus B and this whole thing becomes difficulty index, or so D I. This is one term, so difficulty index. Now if you have a look into this equation, you can see this is very similar to a very familiar equation that you've come across in your life. That equation is the equation of a straight line, which goes by y is equal to c plus mx, where c is the intercept of the straight line on the y-axis, m is the slope, and x is the other variable which goes along the x-axis. Now, if you look at these two equations, you can see this one and this one. If you have a look into these two equations, you can see they're very similar in nature. So, what happens is, <clears throat> this A value is the intercept here. This B value is the slope over here. And this DI value, which is the difficulty index, as explained earlier, is the X value over here. Now, the last variable that we have not discussed is movement time, which is mt. Movement time is the y value over here. Now if you think about the graph of a straight line, if you remember from your high school algebra or basic undergrad mathematics course, it goes like this. This is the x-axis. This is the y-axis. And now if we compare this two equation and their information, you can understand why here is movement time. So movement time in seconds. And x here is the difficulty index. And if we considered the straight line to be like this, we have the intercept, which is C over here, which is the intercept, this information is something different. So this is the intercept, which is related to this A over here, 
is a, so this is a, this is not divided by, this just means that this is a when you compare this equation with that. The slope m is this, how the y changes, how the y changes as x varies. So how the movement time changes as the difficulty index varies. So here we can see as the difficulty index increases, meaning the difficulty of the task increases, we need more time to compute do the task. Now, if you think about it, there is no way you can find out this A and B information from the data that you're going to collect. The only way you can collect this information is through Excel. How would you do that? So I'm going to take out this part. So the first of all, let's see how you would collect the data. So someone starts the timer, 30 seconds. And they say start, you do tapping. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And you remember the amount of tabs that you have made in 30 seconds. So say for instance you are participant number one, which in this case is Esan himself. So participant number one, we make a table like this. Participant Esan. He has four different conditions, as I've said. Different set of conditions based on how far the coins were and how uh, big the coins were. Based on those conditions, we have four different sets of difficulty indexes. So, in the first two columns, we have A, then we have B, then we have C, and let's say D is over here. You will understand. Now, this one is divided into two sections. One is the number of tabs that I've made. So number of tabs on the left column. The total number of tabs in 30 seconds that I've made. This value, say for instance, in one run for condition A, I got 60 tabs. And the number of errors that I've made, error here meaning that when you do this tapping, when you go outside of the circle perimeter, that's an error. So this is, these are the number of errors that you've made while I'm doing the tapping thing. Number of errors. Say for instance I made five. So I, for condition number A with my non-dominant hand, I'm going to do this tapping thing with the index finger. And I'm going to set this table like this and I'm going to place, I'm going to place my data here like this. And I do similar for the second condition where the distance between the coins and the width of the coins have changed. So it's a different game set, meaning we have a changed difficulty index based on how far the coins are and how wide the coins were, as explained earlier. So I compute this value too. So the first data for SN that I have is considering the end effector to be my non-dominant index finger. For my case, it's left, left hand. I do the very same thing with my non-dominant toe. Yes, it's toe. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but um, this is what you have to do. So for your, with your toe, you're gonna do the very same tapping game with your non-dominant toe. Here, non-dominant toe does not make any sense to me, but if I have to make a basic reasoning, it's going to be the toe which I'm least comfortable with. So. This is Esan with the index finger over here. Index finger. And this is the toe. 
in both the cases, it has to be the non-dominant one. So that's how you collect the data. So you can understand, although I've showed this in one table, you will have one table with only information about the index fingers and one table with only information on the toes. And so you can understand based on that that you will have two different graphs. Why two different graphs? So you're not going to have individual graphs, graphs for individual people. You will have a set of data for index finger and a set of data for the toe you're going to take the average of those information and you're going to use those, that average to create one graph for the toe, sorry, for the index finger, and one graph for the toe. Or you can have one graph showing two different things, at two different straight lines at the same time. So I'm going to erase all this. And I'm going to explain to you how you're going to do this. So now we have the graph. I should have used black. So This is the difficulty index, index of difficulty in the x-axis. And the y-axis is movement time. And if you think about it, movement time, as I've said, has to be in seconds. But the information that you get about your movement is based on the number of taps that you have happened to make during the 30 seconds that you were provided, I mean, that you were allocated. So in order to get the movement time information from your tap information, what you need to do is take 30 seconds divided by the number of taps. So for SN, condition number A, you have number of taps to be 60. So here, the time that took Esan to make one tap was 60, 30 divided by 60, because it was the number of taps. So you can understand that it took me point five seconds, half of a second, to make one move, one tap. So you plot this information over here for index of difficulty A, whatever value that is. Then you have a different index of difficulty, and you have a different number of taps. However, still the equation remains the same. 30 seconds divided by the number of taps. So I'm just giving you an idea how this graph is set up. So for condition number B, maybe the difficulty index increased and it took me more time based on this. And similarly for C, similarly for D, I have four different data points and I will get a kind of a straight line which looks like this. And if you use Excel and use the document that I've sent to you, you can actually figure out a way to actually make this straight line. And as I've said earlier that, remember the A and the B values that you had in your movement time equation? The A and the B values? So if Esan had this four different 
values. And if you use scatter plot to plot on those four values, and then follow the instructions in the video, you can actually make this line. And if you select the option straight line, in that case, it's going to make this trend line based on the straight line equation. And if you also add show equation, this is going to find an equation which is an approximation of this straight line automatically for you. And based on that equation, you can actually compare it with this and figure out the value of A and the value of B. B is the slope, A is the intercept. However, this is wrong because as I said, this is only for participant number, participant SM. However, you will have four or five different participants. So the plots that you are going to make over here is going to be based on the average of those four participants considering their situation in A. So this point is going to be an average, average of the four participants' performance using their index finger considering the difficulty, uh, difficulty situation A. Here A will have a value uh, if you think about it because the difficulty index is given by difficulty index is given by log of 2, 1 plus distance divided by the width. So as you can see, it will have a, it will ha A will have a value based on what is the condition over here and here. Now, this is the average representation, straight line representation of the, of all the, across all the participants, considering different difficulty indexes, indices. And this is for the, suppose this is for the index finger. Now you do something similar with the toe, and you get another straight line, which might look like this. This is for the toe. And um, using similar methods as explained in the small video that I've uh, given to you guys, you can actually figure out the A and the B values for the toe as well. And then you can start comparing this to information. One tricky thing that you actually need to think about here is this straight line predicts that this line is going to intersect at this point, where it represents no difficulty index, zero difficulty index. However, you can actually see that even with zero difficulty index, so intuitively it's a very super easy task, you still have some movement. This should make sense to you. This is kind of tricky that I want you to understand that if you're doing something which is super easy, if you're doing something literally, you'll end up having a movement time. I mean, if you did not have a movement time, that means your difficulty index is zero and you have not done any work as well. So your movement time would go to zero and you would have a straight line like this. But just to give you an idea, think about this. I just wanted to give you an idea. Now, there are a few things that you need to understand as you approach this lab. And all this information, additional information, will be uh, given to you um, offline through email and I will also post this video and in the comments section of the video I will, ha I will add all this information. So in question number three, um, it says use a line to best fit to determine the intercept and the slope of both end effectors. What do these constants tell us about the relationship between the movement of the end effectors and the difficulty index? When you answer this question, there are certain things that you need to consider. 
When you answer, you can just explicitly, because I will have access to the graphs in your, in your printed, printed out document. So you don't have to write down the straight line equation redundantly in that question. That will just waste space. So you just give the values for A and B, considering tau and N vector. And based on those A and B and the graph that you have given, explain some of the things that I have uh, mentioned. First of all, what does the different slope, so a slope for the toe, so it has a kind of a slope like this, whereas the, uh, the index finger has a different slope. What this two different slope means physically? And when you answer this question, consider the lab handout and the book. You have to refer yourself to the book to be able to an answer these questions. And when you answer, think about the difficulty indexes in terms of their distance and size. You can actually have a look into the last line of the overview part of the PDF, hand, PDF handout to be able to answer, get an idea. And also, you will get an idea from the very first section of my lecture. So, then, as I've said, you have to answer, talk about these two different intercepts, and what do they physically mean. And when you answer all these things, think about two very important things. Which one of these two indefectors make gross movements as opposed to fine movements? And also think about your anatomy class and think about uh, the Broadman areas of the brain and you know that the, the part of the brain which is highly used has, uh, sorry, the part of the body which is highly used gets a larger part in the brain. So our hands, which we use frequently, has a larger part compared to our legs. So maybe the, some of the answer lies in that con context. So think abstract, think broad as you answer these questions. Um, so think about broadband areas, precision, gross and fine movements. These are hints to this question. And please discuss with your group mates as you try to come up with an answer. Regarding question number four, um, try to relate question number three, your whole idea about Fitt's law and movement and how this difficulty index indices fits in, and try to act, incorporate the information based on your errors, like the kind of errors that you've made, I mean, the, the total number of errors that you've made in different difficulty indexes, indices like corresponding to different difficulty indices. So consider errors as you answer question number four. In question number five, you have to go and refer yourself to the book. It talks about three competing. <coughs> uh, excuse me. So uh, it talks about three competing theories. And as you answer question number five, you have to summarize all those three competing theories on, in your own words and show similarity and dissimilarity of those theories considering the data that you have found in this while doing this lab. And based on the similarity and the dissimilarities, reason in the end which one is the best. And question number six is open. So, and so question number three, four, and five, they have word limits. Please refer yourself to the document. Uh, be careful as you approach your answers. And uh, considering all these three questions, three, four, and five, question number six is kind of open and it lets you think stuff on your own. What would have happened if you wanted to increase your speed? Or if you wanted to decrease your speed, what would have happened? Think about in terms of errors. Think, think about in terms of movement speed, uh, how that will that those two things would have been affected. So to summarize, 
you do the stepping game. You collect data, and you have two different datas: one for your end effectors, one for your le uh, sorry, one for your um, one for your index non-dominant in index finger, one for your non-dominant toe. So you have two separate tables. Each tables have four or five participants doing this stack things under different conditions. So you have a table with all the information about, um, about the task that you have done considering the non-dominant index finger. And you take the average, and when you take the average, always consider 30 seconds divided by taps in order to convert all the taps into seconds, movement times. So consider those averages and make the straight line based on those averages. considering the index finger. And then on the separate table that you have for the toe, do the very same thing. Collect the different data for different participants under different conditions. Take the average of those taps. However, when you take the average, convert all those information into seconds and place those information on the graph based using scatter plot and Use the video that I've talked about to make the trend line. When you make the trend line, make sure you have selected straight line and also have selected show equation so that you can find the A and the B value by comparing the, um, comparing the equation that Excel gave you. And based on those, answer all these questions. And please, please, please um, refer yourself to the lab PDF. Uh, read the supplementary document that, it, uh, that I've made. I'm going to send you an online version of this through YouTube and also through email so you know what I'm expecting as you answer or approach these questions. Um, I've given specific word limits, so be careful on that. with that. Um, that being said, lab number eight is introduced. And take care, guys. Bye.